I'm going to give you a talk about a 10 year journey, really, that um, we've been involved in Antarctica activities. Now, you know, it's amazing when you sort of come to an audience like this, that you guys have sort of been down on the ice. You're doing stunning work looking after penguins, stunning work checking penguins breed properly, and all that lovely work on penguins, and then you're doing amazing things on climate change, and all the stunning research that's out there, and support, and the huge, beautiful planet that we're on, and you've got that amazing wilderness in Antarctica and all the benefits and all the things that we love about that place. But that's not good enough for politicians sometimes. They'd like to know if there's a few dollars involved for the local economy. So, you know, here we come along in. So this is a journey about the how Canterbury and the New Zealand economy benefits from Antarctic activities. And um, I'd really like to acknowledge in the audience Micah, co-author um, across the reports, and Paul Dalziel too, who've helped us on this journey and been part of the journey, probably did all the work and I get the glory, it's great. And there's our little AERU research unit um, at Lincoln University, so lovely you come out and visit us. So thank you um, and um, let's hope that um, you enjoy the talk and what's privilege about this talk isn't so much the figures that we give you, it's the stories that we hear and tell around the reports and around the work we've done. Um, I want to make it really clear that where no attempt is made to look at the economic value of Antarctica, as Paul would say, that would be ridiculous. And when we started this journey about 10 years ago, I was introduced to Michelle and I think she was a little bit terrified to allow economists anywhere near Antarctica. And it was really interesting talking to her about gold mining there. It just sent her straight up. It was brilliant. <laughs> and a bit of oil exploration in the Ross Sea, you know. So, you know, there's no way we're going to um, e e even get into that space. And of course, we start with the Antarctica Treaty that recognises in the interest of all mankind that Antarctica shall continue forever to be used exclusively for peaceful purposes and shall not be the scene or object of international discord. And one of the amazing things that comes out when we talk to people is what an international model Antarctica is. Because it's the one place on the planet everybody looks after each other. That there's cooperation and collaboration. And if you get into trouble, then others will come to you no matter if they're at war in other parts of the world. So it's just a real a magic place for that alone. And then of course we've got the protocol on environmental protection. The parties commit themselves to the comprehensive protection of the Antarctica environment and dependent and associated ecosystems. And hereby designate Antarctica as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. I'm not sure science is quite peaceful at times, but that might be the science community I go in. Um, carrying on the protection of the Antarctica environment and dependent and associated ecosystems and the intrinsic value of Antarctica. Well, sorry, there's a little bit of economic jargon coming in. That's that just we value something because it exists. And that's the real special thing about Antarctica. Um, shall be fundamental considerations in the planning and conduct of all activities in the Antarctic Treaty area, and, and I say long may that continue. <clears throat> the intrinsic value is huge, absolutely ginormous. So the kind of values I'm talking at the moment are little pinpricks, and are pinpricks in particular contexts. Um, the wilderness and ascetic values from that, and of course then there's the value of the science um, and the area that science can be undertaken. Just a bit of defence about economics. This isn't the kind of work we do in general because we're just going to be um, focusing on the dollar figures. In economics, we do look at use and non-use values and do try to make sure that those are considered in political decision making. So, for example, in the UK, I was one, a part of a project that looked at the first time putting non-use val values to treasury to make sure we got environmental protection on some of our lands. So it does have its uses in, pl in places. Um, and the other one is the value of the science. That's just huge, the value of the education. So I want to acknowledge these before we get into the details of the journey we've been on. Sadly, you know, we've yet to f raise the funds to be able to do a, a value of the science down there. It would be a lovely study to do. Um, we've just done the financial benefits. <coughs> Okay, so we've not tried to measure the intrinsic value. 
We're going to focus the financial benefits, the Canterbury and New Zealand economies arising from Antarctica related activities. And these arise, of course, because we are celebrating in the studies we're doing Christchurch as a gateway city. And Christchurch is, of course, the gateway city that also flows out benefits from that to the rest of the New Zealand economy. There's a pretty picture. And, of course, Christ, all those um, have got a long and rich history, but Christchurch, we've got a special history as well, a um, place where many of the heroic expeditions came from. So you've got a long association between the Christchurch and Canterbury populations with act activities going down on the ice. And you've just got to see that if you go to the museum or any of the other places that there's artefacts and exhibitions on Antarctica. And you see the pictures of when Scott's expeditions went down south and the crowds that flocked to see them. And what's new? I mean, the Brits came back, for God's sake. You can tell by my accent where I come from. And people flocked to see their ship. You know, you just think of the open day in, in Canterbury when the um, US opened up and allowed people into the aircraft. It just shows there's still that deep connection between the city and the activities that you guys are on the front line of. Also, um, another factor about us being Gateway City is, of course, we've got the US close to us and they figure quite large in, in our figures. So, does the position of Christchurch as one of the five gateway cities to the global natural reserve of Antarctica have measurable economic impacts on Canterbury and New Zealand? That's our research question for what it was. And um, why the hell did we do that? Why should anybody, why is anybody interested? You know, and I mean, you guys working down on the ice, we go, what is this about? Well, the first report came out um, from the Canterbury Development Corporation. Um, and we were commissioned to do the work for that report. And there was the context of that report at the time was there was the gossip. I'm going to say gossip, but there was the feel that the US might go and leave Christchurch and put more of its activities at Hobart. There was a feel of that time that the city wasn't that connected as much to the activities of Antarctica. And that, you know, the, the great and the good around the city um, perhaps wouldn't put so much TLC um, into um, Antarctica or attention at that. So we were commissioned to see, well, did it have an impact on the Christchurch and Canterbury economies? So we could tell to our local and national politicians who might be narrow-minded narrow enough not to see the broader benefits for their particular bits of community, um, was there benefit for them? And that's sort of the context. So we were privileged, um, we, it was the first attempt, um, we had amazing assistance, it was just a wonderful job to do. We went and talked to the US programme, the New Zealand programme people, the patients, we talked to firms, businesses, hoteliers, um, you name it. And we were blown away, um, as were the people who got the report by the scale and the range of activities that were associated with Antarctica going on in the city. I'll just stress, this report, we were just asked to do Canterbury, not New Zealand. It really focused on Canterbury. We did get some benefits for New Zealand where we were looking for Canterbury benefits and they just happened to be um, associated or there. And these were the kind of results we came up with. Um, these are the total benefits of Antarctica activities to the Canterbury economy. The National Antarctica programs. Now, in this one, we really had good data from the US and good data from New Zealand. So those are really the two programs there. Um, tourism, you'll perhaps see later on as we go into detail as how we did the other programs, what comprises that. The fishing, education and research and the Antarctica heritage. And again, we're going to go into those a little bit more detail. So that, but the figure, the bottom line figure that the benefit for Canterbury was 155 million. And um, we then came up with some conclusions from that report. And one was that we should build on these amazing things that are going on that we should continue investment in Antarctica-related infrastructure in Christchurch. And we've done two more reports since then, and that has continued. 
you know, so there's, uh, we always have talks about what's the facilities out at Littleton. There's a little bit of tension because the Littleton people like those funny cruise ships, where it's got to make sure there's enough berths for Antarctica related vessels um, and what their requirements might be. So, you know, again, an ongoing discussion with the city council, with Christchurch City Holdings about what facilities there. Facilities at the airport. Probably less of an issue in the last report when we were doing the interviews, um, but at the time they were talking about maybe specialist hangars for some of the aircraft. So, you know, thinking about what were the infrastructure requirements and what was special about Christchurch is, of course, we do have the port and we do have the airport um, that can support the anti um, activities. One of the biggest things that came out, sounds a bit funny, won't in a minute to me, um, was the importance, how much the US really appreciate the welcome they had to the committee, to the a city. Now Paul gives it its official title, it's the official opening welcome of the season or something. I call it, it's the cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> and actually at the time Gary Moore was thinking of stopping it. The, you know, the opening season and all the stuff the city does to welcome. And the report really backed up don't. That is vital and it's really important for the US people to have that. And so it's continued. We have this amazing week of activities that is really appreciated. Um, beware of competition for Tasmania. And I said, oh, do we need that in Paul? Less now. This was that report. And then what have you just told me, Brian? They're just investing 255 million in infrastructure in Tasmania. So great fun journey. Then we did the second report. Um, the main difference to this one, we were asked to include New Zealand, to go much broader. And with the first report, those were the old days, you know, not quite so good days when Lou Sampson was Chief Executive of Antarctica New Zealand. But Lou always, time when he saw me, said, God, that report's fantastic. We need that figure. I use it all the time. Well, dear old Peter's come along and Peter picked up this report and picked up and commissioned the next one. So this was actually commissioned by Antarctica New Zealand. So thank you. Um, and we spent a bit more time in this one looking at the strengths and weaknesses of the, bus uh, of the businesses and the business community and how that connected um, with Antarctic activities. Again, a real privilege um, to go out and interview and talk to people. A slight hiccup with this one, it was we were about to go and interview and doing the research at the time when they nearly shut down the US program because of the budgets. And so I did feel sorry, you're sending these emails to the US people going, can we have the money things? And you, know, you feel they want to say back, we're just about to be shut down, just leave us alone, you know, why do we care about you? Um, and so the recommendations of that was a strong capability for a whole of government response. We got a little bit of tension then between the heritage people and I'm going to call them the science people or the people who are going down to doing stuff now on the ice, it was them and us. And it was such a shame because we're all in it together. It's all a big jigsaw piece and, and you know, let's celebrate the heritage, but it's not them or us. Should be, and so trying to have a bit more of an overview of that. Environmental protection. And the other thing that comes out really, really strongly about the benefits of Antarctica is diplomacy. From a number of levels. One is it gives us a voice on an international stage that's way above our punch weight. And it's not just because we're there on the treaties and there on, you know, the negotiations for Antarctica, but it helps us in other spheres of negotiation. Okay, because I do a bit on the trade stuff and things like that. So that's a huge benefit of us being involved um, in Antarctica. And the other recommendation, well it wasn't really a recommendation, is dear old Margaret, she did send her apologies, um, she couldn't make it, um, for a dedicated Antarctica research initiative and we're going to pick up that again um, in the latest report. Um, but the bit that really came out of this report was that the fact businesses just buzzed about doing work in Antarctica and it was just magic to go in and talk to these businesses and they'd go, oh yeah, we had a phone call from Scott Page today, it was dead exciting, everybody dropped the desks and we were all listening and that kind of thing. And it really struck us that um, we got businesses in Christchurch and in New Zealand working in the world's harshest environment, testing products in, in extreme conditions where you can't pick up the phone and say, can you send friend the technician out? And, you know, the, thinking about celebrating this 
in, for the firms themselves and their businesses and their products, um, we felt could be quite important. There you go, Eric, there's one for you. And so we are going to be thinking about that, aren't we? Be good. The last report, there we are. Now, this is not yet published because it's on Peter's desk. He's got a couple of comments back. We've got them to go back to him. And I don't know if it's going to be released or not, and I won't embarrass him by asking. Um, OK, we, this is what we did. We defined the categories of economic benefits. And believe you me, Micah deserves a medal because when we get these lists in from the New Zealand and the US programs, they are incredibly detailed lists. So thank you, thank you, thank you for them to giving that to us and trusting us enough that, to know that we would never um, you know, disrespect that data that we're given. But it has to be categorized into different sectors. And then from that, we calculate the direct benefits. That's the expenditure that's going on. OK, um, then we collect the indirect revenues and I'll go into the definition in a minute, the induced and then the employment impacts. And the benefit categories are here, the broad benefit categories. We have the National Antarctica Science Programs. So in the old days, it was really just the US and New Zealand. But of course, the incredible work that you guys have done, we've got the Koreans here, the Italians, even the Chinese sniffing around. Um, Antarctic tourism and events, quite a, an eclectic um, set of those, as we'll see. We've got the commercial fishing, um, education and research that, of course, um, Gateway, absolutely central in that, and then the Antarctica heritage. So the direct effects, as I've said, people participating in the studies, giving us information on their total spending, OK? Um, and we also interviewed key personnel and used official sources of information to supplement that information. So, backed up that. We then used dear old Jeff Butcher, who um, helps us um, develop multipliers for the Canterbury region. And a multiplier is just saying, okay, I have spent, um, I don't know, on clothing, let's say, $100 million on clothing to support the Antarctica activities in Christchurch. Well, in that clothing, they've also had to buy supplies in to make that clothing. They've had to buy maybe machinery in or equipment or paper or things like that. And we call that the indirect effects. And we have multiplier tellers that tell us for each sector what is the um, indirect effects of expenditure associated with that. And Oh, we use clothing. I just thought I had my head. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and then the people who get paid that money, they go, oh, well, I worked for um, the clothing firm and I'm rushing out and that kind of thing. They support local businesses too. We call that sort of induced expenditure, household expenditure out there. So you can see, you know, that ripple effect in the economy. Um, and then we calculate from that the employment impact. OK, so let's look at these benefit ones, what's going on there. There's a pretty picture of the US summer crew coming home at the end of um, the 2013-14 season. As I said, for the first two reports, it was mainly New Zealand and um, the US. For the, I, actually, I nearly fainted. I said to Micah, I said, look, we'll ask the Italians and Koreans. We'll never get any data. We, you know, don't, don't worry about it. And we got emails back from Italy and Korea. <laughs> Um, so, for the latest study, we've been able to um, real data from those guys as well, so that's really good. Um, in the 2013 study, the estimated direct impacts of the national science programs were highly significant. I mean, it's a lot of money, 38.7 million, and a further 7.8 in the rest of New Zealand. Um, these are the kind of eclectic things we looked at at tourism. Um, and the tourism things that are going on around um, Antarctica. When we men first mentioned tourism, I better say this fast, um, in the interviews and stuff like that, there was a bit of nervousness that we were sending down ships to offload at Scott Base and shifting the scientists out with bunk beds there. May I hasten to add, <laughs> this tourism is tourism mostly that takes place in Canterbury, associated with Antarctica activities, rather than me advocating that we should have um, access onto the ice, so that there's no adv advocate for that at all. 
So we're talking about act activities like this, such as the museum. And the museum are very kindly, we go and interview them, they talk about that, they've done surveys, they get a feel for how many people go to the museum to look at their exhibitions and we take a proportion of that. When you do these studies, um, these economic impact studies, we always underestimate. There's too many people out there doing these kind of studies that overestimate. So you have to, to be you know, respectable, you just make sure you're always just going on the, um, there's one exception on the fish maybe, um, on, on the underside. And then also there's the International Antarctica Centre. So they get visitors through, quite a substantial amount of money comes into the economy through people visiting that and going seeing the penguins and riding the big things and going into a room and getting cold. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and an early 2015 amazing phase of this work was completed, conservation of three historical bases and more than 18,000 artefacts. Um, we've just found the spending on that though has gone up and up. When the first report it was about a million or so, 4.1 million and gone up again for, the, um, for this report. So, here's the 2013 um, figures, the direct ones. And so the direct, that's 100 million just direct before we knock on those knock-on knock effects in Canterbury. And for New Zealand, 161.7. The total benefits, 187. And for the rest of New Zealand, 393. So these figures, again, were enough for politicians to be able to say, yes, we should support Christchurch as a gateway city for all the wonderful reasons of science, diplomacy and all the other things, but also for pure um, economic benefits to New Zealand. And it also helps our jobs. Okay, um, we haven't provided the 2016 figures. Um, as I say, Peter's um, reviewing the report. They are greater. Okay? So the amount of activity we're attracting around Antarctica activities is growing. And boy, do we think it's ever going to grow. Because here's some of the new initiatives that are coming up. I haven't got on these slides the, the Antarctica attraction, which again, they've got serious investment um, proposals for that. So that's another big boost of expenditure. And then, of course, when that's up and running, um, hopefully it'll attract more visitors. It is interesting about the impact of the earthquakes on visitors. They have dropped down. They are beginning to come back up again. Um, and we heard that from a number of sources, the museum, the attraction, and that kind of one. So you can see those tourism figures um, rising again on the back of that one. But they're rebuilding McMurdo Sound. I don't know if rebuild's the right word. Reconstructing, whole new thing. It's amazing if you go to the website and see what they're up to. And it's going to be ginormous. So if we can't get our paws on some of that action in Christchurch, we're doing something wrong. But it's going to be big. There's a lot going on at Scott Base. Currently there's upgrades going on, field centres, and so a considerable amount of money being spent on that. But one of the things, if Peter forgives me, um, is that really struck me, he's told me that, and you guys know because you're down there on the ice, um, is the nature of the research there is changing. And it requires much deeper and harder logistical support because you're going further away from the bases, you're doing things that I don't understand but you're doing more stuff and it's harder, okay? And so you're gonna need better logistical support and there's gotta be better investment into Scott Base to help provide that. And the excellent safety records. I mean, you know, it's a pretty place. And so Scott Base is coming up for being reconstructed too. I'm not looking at Peter in case he's screaming at me. Is that right? <laughs> uh, rebuilt or whatever. And what we want is a real special rebuild, not just the same, we want it really a stepwise change so it can support this kind of research, not just the research you're doing now, but what your kiddies are going to want to do in 50 years time. So, you know, we want to make a really strong case that the investment the government should put into that should make sure it supports and that New Zealand is that key party we are because we are, we're around the table almost on equal footing to the big countries. If we want to maintain that, we've got to do stuff like this. Is that right? <clears throat> and again, it's a huge opportunity for Christchurch and our businesses. It's magic, we've got the Antarctica office because there's all this eclectic activity going on. We've talked about, we've got the businesses, we've got the programs, we've got um, the tourism activities, we've got the museums, we've got all those little jigsaw pieces to have somewhere that can help as a conduit, help communications um, and help just initiatives um, and make sure the city and the community supports Antarctica activities. And also gives lots of money for the ARU for research to help sure it continues. <laughs> Never miss a thing. Well, it's been a privilege to be involved in this work, being 10 years now on and off, had us back. 
Um, thank you for sitting, being so patient. Um, just to talk and be involved with people about this. So thank you very much for being patient and I, I'm supposed to be happy to answer questions. I actually changed that, I'm happy to have a glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs>